Hello, I'm Justin Clement. Welcome to the Lunch and Learn series for 2021, hosted by Valley Forge Park Alliance. We have a great talk prepared today uh, called Crime and Punishment at Valley Forge. Uh, but before we begin, I do invite you to go into speaker view rather than gallery view. That'll give you the most clear view of the talk through Zoom. Also, uh, as a housekeeping tip, uh, we, we do recommend that you go to vfparkalliance.org in the future to learn about all upcoming events uh, at the park. The Lunch and Learn series is every single Wednesday, so we're here weekly. Bring your lunch uh, and hopefully learn something as well. Uh, so this is hosted weekly. Also, find out about other events going on at the park. Uh, now, the talk today, Crime and Punishment at Valley Forge. Uh, it's being given by park guide Russell Brindley. Uh, Russell studied history and social studies education at Rutgers University and the Rutgers Graduate School of Education. He's passionate about history and the ways it connects all of us. Uh, he is now currently part of the uh, uh, permanent position of the staff of the Interpretation and Education Division at Valley Forge National Historical Park. Uh, before that, he worked for three summer seasonal positions at Valley Forge, uh, as well as four different public schools within New Jersey, teaching social studies. Uh, Russell is grateful for the amazing opportunity to work for the National Park Service and considers it America's best idea, something that many of our viewers would uh, perhaps agree with. So uh, without further ado, I would like to welcome Russell Brindley and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Justin. I hope everyone can hear me well. So as Justin said, my name is Russell Brindley. I'm one of the park guides here at Valley Forge. And my topic for all of you today is crime and punishment at Valley Forge and a little bit talking holistically about that with the Continental Army. So let me share my screen here. And so what I'm gonna do there's going to be plenty of time for questions at the end, and Justin informed me that, you know, this is going to be more of a conversation presentation, so you may chime in with some questions that you have, so please send that, send them to us, and hopefully I can answer them, and if I can't answer them, I will do my best to reach back to you with some research and point you in the right direction. All right, so I'm going to break down this program into four different components. We're going to look at briefly the conditions that the Army faced that led to discipline issues and problems here at Valley Forge and a little bit before. We're going to determine what those problems were. Third point is going to be determine the different types of punishments that fitted those crimes. And then finally, how did discipline and how did the punishments change soldiers experiencing them or witnessing them on others? So to understand what's going on at Valley Forge, you have to look back at the Philadelphia campaign of 1777. This was a brutal campaign in and around our neck of the woods here. So we're talking about in Delaware, in Southern New Jersey, in Delaware, parts of Maryland, Chester County, which will eventually be part of also Delaware County, Philadelphia, Montgomery County, and also into Bucks County. Now, with that being said, it was a failed military campaign, unfortunately, for the Continental Army and General Washington. They had six major defeats. You might know some of them, like Brandywine, Germantown, Fort Mifflin, Fort Mercer. Battle of the Clouds was a defeat for the Continental Army. The Paley Massacre, the south of Valley Forge, was a disaster for Anthony Wayne soldiers under Washington, and including the burning of the iron forges and supplies being stored at Valley Forge before the army actually got there. In addition to that, the state government and Continental Congress had to flee Philadelphia and go out 80 miles west of here towards Lancaster and York, Pennsylvania. And so you can see some of those movements on that map right there of the British forces and the American forces crisscrossing our neck of the woods here. Now, at the beginning of the campaign, the army had about 23,000 soldiers, uh, pretty much equal size to the British army. And when they march into Valley Forge months later, they're down to anywhere from 19,000 to 12,000. That's a big range. 
because uh, the Journal of the American Revolution just published an article, and I believe, Justin, you correct me on this, that um, one of the Lunch and Learns is going to be talking to those two gentlemen about their scholarly research and looking at the numbers and, and the discrepancy between our narrative of 12,000 and theirs upwards of 19,000. So I'm going to give you ranges a little bit more now with that, with that research that I've been looking into as well. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. So uh, if you look at our event calendar, you'll see that uh, um, we have a, an event that is discussing the, the actual numbers of the Continental Army. And uh, uh, throughout this talk, as Russell said, if you have any questions, please post them to the Q&A uh, or join us in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Appreciate it. The low point in the encampment is going to be anywhere from, from March March and February of 1778. So we're talking about enlistments being up, diseases starting to spread rampant because it's a mild, wet, rainy winter here at Valley Forge, not the mythology of the snow drifts or up to their eyeballs six feet tall. No, this disease is going to linger and there's all these problems that are facing this army. So it's going to be anywhere from 11,000 to 14,000 soldiers. So it's a crisis. In addition to that, Washington's dealing with the lack of supplies for the Continental Army. As you can see in some of these images here of the Battle of Brandywine and, and then on the bottom corner there, the Battle of Germantown, you can see the soldiers are starting to lose and, and be in rags, their clothing, it's in tatters. They're also gonna complain about the lack of food on the march and the burning of supplies and not getting the food. They're living hand to mouth is another problem. George Norton of Ipswich wrote, on January 18th of 1778 here at Valley Forge, nothing to eat but frozen meat and bread. So they're not getting the daily rations that are required for the army. Payment for the soldiers and the officers is nor notoriously slow and uncertain throughout the war. Some, some cases, the soldiers are going months without pay, some officers possibly even years. So it's a big financial drain on these people who are trying to fight for their country and they're not getting the, the things that they were promised to them. Another example at Valley Forge is that 50 men holding commissions in General Green's division will resign in a single day because their families home are, back home are suffering and they need to go back and take care of them to the best of their ability. So it's a crisis. And so as you see here, this is the Trudeau famous painting in the late 1800s of Washington's army marching in to Valley Forge. And so you could see what I was talking about with this, with the army being tired, hungry, maybe they want to go home and they're in rags. You can see their, their long sleeves turned into short sleeves, their, their pants turned into shorts, perfect for summer weather, like on a, on a hot day like today, but not in the uh, December when it, there's snow on the ground and it's raining and it's 30 to 40 degrees outside, they're miserable. In addition to that, as you see, some of the soldiers possibly are don't have their shoes on or they're, they're barely holding on. They marched over 200 miles in and around our neck of the woods. And so their clothes are just dissolving into nothing. And so Washington's gonna write to Henry Lawrence. He's the president of Continental Congress, Washington's boss on the 23rd of December of 1777. He says, I am now convinced beyond a doubt that unless some great and capital change suddenly takes place in that line, this army must inevitably be reduced to one or the other of these three things, starve, dissolve, or disperse in order to attain subsistence in the best manner that they can. So it's again, it's this crisis. So all this stuff is going to feed into soldiers at lashing out against others, their officers, and even Washington himself. So Washington really needs to figure out what to do about this crisis situation that he's dealing with. And so Washington's gonna fear that this might happen. This is going to happen three years later in Morristown, our sister national park, similar uh, story of a winter encampment for Washington's army. And we have soldiers turning on their officers. This is the Pennsylvania line mutiny of 1781. Washington fears that this could happen at Valley Forge. There's been some small cases of it up until Valley Forge, and he doesn't want this to possibly a large scale where the army walks off the job. He wants them to focus, not finding each other, fighting the British. And you can see here in that Pennsylvania line mutiny, some of the officers are killed by the Continental soldiers, the people they're in charge of, and they actually flee the encampment, leave Washington when they're not supposed to, and their plan is to go capture Congress, 
the ones who were in control of the supplies and the money, and the state government of New Jersey. Luckily, Washington's able to quash that mutiny three years later. But again, he's got that in the back of his mind, that this, something like this could possibly happen here at Valley Fort, because it has happened in small cases before Valley Fort. In addition to that, there's going to be mutinies all over the 13 colonies, including the invasion of Canada in the beginning of the Revolutionary War. So the most numbered is going to be New York, 14 cases of soldiers mutiny against each other and their officers and generals. While well, Pennsylvania, our backyard, there was nine cases of it. And Virginia and South Carolina, they have seven for South Carolina and Virginia, five. So there's a total of 56 of, of instances throughout the, the nine, eight to nine year war of the army rebelling against each other. And some of those causes, like I talked about for the Philadelphia campaign, food, expired service, discipline issues, the lack of clothing, the lack of pay. And so there's about seven cases of that in 1777, three cases of it in 1778. In addition to that, there's gonna be one large case of that happening at Valley Fort. It's not gonna to be to the scale of soldiers fighting each other, but they're gonna to refuse to do what they're supposed to be doing on a large scale. That's December 21st of 1777. The Tatians from all the brigades are unable to assemble. That means they're unable to present themselves to the officers and Washington to march out of Valley Forge and engage the British. The reason why Washington wants to send some of the soldiers out of Valley Forge three days after the encampment starts is because he gets word from spies that the British are sending large forces from Philadelphia into what is now Delaware County and parts of Chester County to forge for supplies. And Washington feels like this is a perfect opportunity to strike the British out in the open field. However, the soldiers refuse to leave the encampment because of the conditions that I mentioned before. In addition to that, Washington's gonna write about this in his general orders sending them down the command, robberies lately committed by soldiers, committed by the army at Valley Forge, committed against our friends. So he's referring to the local inhabitants, the farmers in and around Valley Forge, are the highest degree of race cruel and therefore, and shall receive the severest punishment. So the soldiers are going out there and harassing, without Washington's permission, the farmers and taking food, cattle, damaging their fences, harassing them. And, and, it's, and it's a big problem because those are the same people that Washington's relying on to provide food, other material supplies, and intelligence of what's going on in Philadelphia with the British Army, just like how he got word that the British Army was going out towards Darby by the airport today. And if the soldiers keep doing this, guess what? Those farmers, are not gonna provide food, clothing, and intelligence to the American army. They're gonna provide food, clothing, and intelligence for the British army. Uh, Russell, yeah. if a, a moment, please. Yeah, uh, absolutely. We've had a few comments in the chat uh, mm -hmm. where you're not coming across entirely clear. Oh. Um, I don't know if you can uh, perhaps speak a little bit louder. Sure. Thank Sorry you. about that, folks. I hope you can hear me now. Justin, let me know if that's better or worse. <laughs> Just do your best. Okay. Uh, I will uh, say to uh, our audience that we are recording this. Uh, so if you want to revisit this talk on YouTube, uh, I will do my best to uh, filter the audio uh, before uploading it to YouTube. Thank I appreciate you. that, Justin. And I apologize, folks, if I'm not coming in as clear as it should be. The joys of technology it doesn't work all the time on us. So with the crisis going on with the army, with the possible fear that the army is going to dissolve and start attacking each other and also harassing the local inhabitants, Washington needs to figure out, like I said, what's going on with all of that. So I discovered in our collection a study done in 1972, as you can see on the screen here, by Paul G. Atkinson of the System of Military Discipline and Justice in the Continental Army from August of 1777 until June of 1778. So we're talking about the Philadelphia Campaign and Valley Forge encampments, the whole six months. 
until the largest cases of soldiers misbehaving because of those factors that I talked about is desertion. There's 50 cases of soldiers just walking off the job. War's over, see you later, good riddance. 52 cases of, of officers um, not presenting themselves in a professional manner. You have eight cases of soldiers going to the British lines in and around Philadelphia. Numerous cases of soldiers threatening to desert and saying that out loud. Disobeying orders, like those large contingent of soldiers in the beginning of the encampment, 33. Not doing what they're supposed to be doing, going out there uh, foraging for food or, or doing the picket line or building fortifications, 25 cases. Communicating with the British in Philadelphia, two cases. Threat theft, so stealing from the farmers, 14. Getting drunk on the job, 13. 10 cases of mutiny, so again, soldiers lashing out. 10 cases of assault, so fighting each other. Six cases of gaming, so we're talking about gambling, playing cards or dice. Washington writes in a general order on the 31st of December of 1777, gaming of every kind is expressly forbidden and is the foundation of evil and will ruin many a brave and good officers. So again, Washington's trying to clamp down on all these vices that are going on in the encampment. Losing your weapon, four cases of that. Stealing horses from, from the army or from farmers, three cases of that. Wounding somebody, three cases. Challenging someone to a duel for your honor, two cases. Sleeping on the job, two cases of that. One case of somebody being murdered in the military encampment or during the Philadelphia campaign by another soldier. Selling your weapon, one. Cursing Congress, one case of that. I bet nobody would do that today. And so there was a total of 422 cases of people misbehaving in the Continental Army during the Philadelphia campaign and at Valley Forge. So what I really wanted to do was it's good to know what's going on at, in the Philadelphia campaign because we talk about it a lot at the park. But I want to focus on how many of those numbers are going to be just at Valley Forge. So what I did was I got inspired by a coworker of mine who I can't thank enough, Steve Walter. He's another park guy here at the park. And what he was doing was looking at the general orders of the day. We have an actual book of it. And you can find a lot of that on, on founders only on the uh, National Archives of Washington and some of those other founding fathers. And he wanted to digitize it in a searchable way so we can pull it for programming, for Facebook posts, or for websites instead of trying to type it all out and looking through all these books. So what he was also doing was pulling other resources, other journals of officers and privates, the farmers in the area if possible, including newspapers and the British in Philadelphia and compiling all that. So looking at those Word documents, I got inspired to say, you know what? Let me really look at the general orders and see if there's any cases of soldiers misbehaving. And there is. In all the general orders that Washington writes throughout the war, there's gonna be cases of some of the soldiers misbehaving. And you can see a list. I did it month by month of determining how many soldiers were misbehaving here at Valley Fort. So five in December, because the, the army is only here for about a week and a half in December. It's going to really ramp up in February, March, and April. Again, it's springtime. The dampness is still there in the encampment. The supplies are still bad. They're trying to get better. And then eventually when the army gets, when the army gets closer to march out, those infractions become less and less common in the general orders. 29 and 20, as you see there. And so what I did, in addition to doing that, I created Excel spreadsheets of listing the date of the incident, as you can see on the top there, the name of the person, their regiment, what their crime was, and what their punishment was. And this is just a very small sample of that research. I have two slides for that. So if we look at the bottom there, December 23rd, 1777, one woman, we don't know her name. We don't know what regiment she was from. Most likely she's a camp follower. So that means she's married to a soldier 
or a widower in this army, don't know where, she has nowhere else to go. So she's following her husband from place to place or he passed away before and she's serving a role as a possibly doing laundry or maybe doing some of the cooking or being a nurse possibly in this army. Eventually she's caught stealing. Unfortunately, it doesn't tell us what she stole or how much and her punishment is to be drummed out of the camp. And what does that mean? And she's gonna be put on a cart. The drummers are gonna be in the, pr in the front of that, making all sorts of noise and commotion. Other soldiers from the regiment or wherever she is located are gonna present themselves on both sides and they're setting an example for everybody. This is what happens if you steal and you get caught in this encampment, you get kicked out of the army. That's her livelihood possibly. So now she has to go out towards possibly Lancaster, or maybe they send her in between here in Philadelphia, where both armies are fighting for supplies and there isn't really much left and it's a hostile environment for strangers like this woman. So we don't know what happened to her, but that's just one example of some of the different types of punishments, and I'll talk more about them later on. In February, as you see on the second slide here, you're going to see a large cases of locals, inhabitants of Pennsylvania, Unfortunately, it doesn't describe what town they're from, if they're from Darby, if they're from out towards Lancaster, if they're up in Bucks County. We don't know for sure. But a lot of these people, like Philip Kurt there, that second line, supplying the enemy, the bridge, with cattle. He's going to be sentenced to be confined in some type of jail in Pennsylvania, or maybe a local jail, maybe towards Doylestown, for example. And his property is going to be taken by the United States government to be sold and used. So they determined that his punishment was so extreme that they're taking away all his livelihood for trading with the British. Another example there is David Dune. He's going to get 250 lashes on his back, for example, for supplying the British with cattle. It is kind of extraordinary when you think about it, that military justice is being applied to civilians. Yes. Um, so this is essentially martial law that is uh, being uh, practiced over the civilian population trapped between two armies mm -hmm. uh, here in southeast Pennsylvania. You're absolutely right, Justin. And, 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 and there's going to be at least 38 civilians, based on my tallying of references in the general orders. Again, we don't know where they are from, unfortunately, of being having that punishment uh, handed down to them by the Continental Army or by the local authorities in the area. So we know there is a good amount of loyalists in the area, people trading with the British. A good example is Bucks County. To the east of us, a lot of Tories, a lot of loyalists to the British, telling the British Army with spies and all that, come out here, trade with us, protect us from George Washington's army to the west at Valley Forge. And eventually they'll start doing that against the militia who's fighting the British out there. And so what I did was, with that chart, I broke down the list and numbers of all the different infractions of the civilians in the area and the soldiers. So you can see there, for example, stealing, 23 cases of it, walking off the job, 16. Deserting to the British Army, you got 12 there. That person cursing Congress, there's one case of that. 37 soldiers or, and or civilians supplying goods to the British Army in and around Philadelphia. Two cases of plundering, 14 cases of fighting, so fighting each other, possibly fighting a civilian. We don't know for sure. So it's 252 cases in the six months here at Valley Forge. That's a lot of people misbehaving here at Valley Forge. And those are the ones who got caught. So it could have been a lot higher. We don't know for sure. Now, so you're tired, you're hungry, you want to go home. You're going to do one of these actions. What's going to happen to you if you get caught is my third part of this talk for you folks. And again, Justin, if you want to stop or anything like that for questions, please let me know. Sure. We do have a related question, yeah. which I'm sure you'll get to later. But uh, uh, in the 
punishments uh, that you had up there was with the, the lashing uh, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the lashes be applied, quote, well laid on. Yes. Uh, and that term didn't uh, appear in all of the entries. Uh, do you? Uh, no. And I'm not 100% sure why not. Um, I know there's some discrepancies in some of the general orders. They're more descriptive than others. I know I've seen some references to punishment in Washington's exchanges with some of the generals, like John Lacey, he's, a, he's in charge of the Pennsylvania militia, and he's talking about punishing some of the locals in the area because he's in charge of protecting Bucks County from British um, forces, which he doesn't do successfully, unfortunately, during the encampment. So there's some more descriptions than others in there. So I'm not 100% sure why that is. If I don't know if it's a style thing or it's, you know, they're really trying to make a point, you know, make sure you really punish this person compared to maybe not so much with this person. I know Washington will do clemency and I'll talk more about that later on. He does do a lot of that. He, he gets in the fray and he says, no, this is wrong. Let's release this person or that person. He does do that, but I'm not hundred percent sure why, why in, in that sense, in those, in the writings. Yeah, another question is, uh, did soldiers really understand uh, what uh, unsoldierly manner, uh, you know, or unsoldier-like behavior, uh, what that might be? Uh, um, I mean, were yeah. the, the expectations clearly laid out for soldiers uh, yeah. that, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> when it comes to their, their behavior, that might be punished mm -hmm. afterwards? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say no on that. The reason why is Valley, the main story of Valley Forge is you have 11 armies coming in here doing 11 different things, marching, drilling, setting up the encampment, 11 different ways. So it's not standardized. It's standardized from your, your local regimental commander to your, you know, your brigade commander to your general, General Smallwood, for example, in charge of the Delaware and the Maryland soldiers. Right, so and by, every, by 11 armies, different. I mean 11 yes, states. 11 different right. states, exactly. Thank you for, yep, for trying me there with that. Yeah, so 11 different states doing 11 different things with their 11 different commanders. So I always equivalent, if you're on a sports team, try getting just directions from 11 different people telling you 11 different things. You would have no idea what's going on. And that's what happens in a lot of these battles because Washington's telling the army to do this and they're, they're hodgepodge doing different things. A good example is the battle of Germantown where there's miscommunications and soldiers are firing on each other instead of the British. And, and the weather and other things are gonna play a factor into that. But so Washington's trying to get time to say, this isn't working. We need to standardize how we march, how we fire our muskets, how we lay out this encampment. And, and Steuben, if the German or Prussian is gonna come and help Washington lay out that kind of thing. And the blue book is created a, a set of standards for the army which will eventually influence and, and be the creation at Valley Forge, the United States Army that we know today. And they still use parts of the Blue Book created at Valley Forge, written officially the following year, but it all started at this place. So soldiers are gonna hear different things from their officers, just like when you're in school real quick, you have a teacher who's really lenient and then you have a teacher that's really strict. Well, okay, I can get away with doing this in this classroom, but I can't do that in that classroom. So unfortunately that's what's happening. And so there's gonna be this confusion and, and it's gonna happen throughout the war, but it's gonna to try to get more organized as we go along. So I hope that answered that person's question for you. So section three, so you, you did something bad. You had the motivation to do something bad because you're tired, you're hungry, you wanna go home. So maybe you stole. What's gonna to happen to you? Hopefully, you're going to get caught by these guys in and around the encampment, or maybe an officer or another soldier. And these guys are the provost troops of light dragoons or mounted military police, like the MPs that they have today, military police in the army. And they're under the command of a gentleman named Captain Bartholomew von Heer, the German. And Congress is going to officially organize this corps of the military police towards the end of the encampment, but they're still around as a minor role. And, they're, and they have a big task to do. And their task is to watch over the regularity of the encampment. 
So make sure people are doing what they're supposed to be doing. That's going to be very hard doing that with maybe 200 soldiers compared to 19,000 people they have to watch. They're also going to try to do that on the march, making sure people are doing what they're supposed to be doing, not deserting, not wandering off from place to place. They're hopefully going to try to quell riots. So that outbreak, like the Pennsylvania line mutiny two years later, unfortunately, they're not really around to, to do that, but that's their whole kind of idea. They're hopefully also going to try to detect spies, people spying on this encampment or bringing information to and from, including supplies. So they're going to hopefully try to catch these people. They're hopefully going to try to regulate the sutlers. And the sutlers are locals in the area who come to Valley Forge to sell their goods in certain locations, certain times of the week. So they're hopefully going to make sure those people are selling things that they're supposed to be selling and not misbehaving themselves. So they have a tall order. But let's just say you get caught by one of these guys. Where are you going to go? They're going to put you in a small jail. We don't exactly know where that would have been. There was some, there was possibly some type of structure along Route 23 past the chapel, and I'll kind of point it out when I get a map in a second. And they're going to hopefully, after that, small stay in a jail, they're going to send you to these two places. These are the locations of the court marshals. We have them today in the park still. On your right is Varnum's quarters, the Stevens family farmhouse. It's going to be taking place on the second level. On your left, you have the David Potts house, or the bake house, as we call it. And we're talking about the farthest part on the left-hand side. And you can still see these lovely structures today in the park. The David Potts house is located off of 252 and 23, while Varnum's quarters is in between Torstock 9, the chapel, and the Stuyven statue. And you can park at the Stuyven statue, and there's a small path to walk over to that structure. So possibly the, uh, the jail for the provost troops, if you get caught, you're going to, it's probably, there's some, probably some straw structure just around where the Patriots of African Descent Monument was located because Route 23 was here at Valley Forge. It was called Old Nut Road and it went out towards Phoenixville just like it does today. And so what is a court martial at those structures? It's a presiding panel that was both the judge, the jury, not necessarily your peers. So it's going to be officers, occasionally some of the generals like Muhlenberg or General Smallwood that I mentioned or General Wheaton. And there's going to be about 13 of them that are going to be in charge at those two structures. And what are they going to do? So I kind of broke down what a court martial looks like during the American Revolution. You get caught. Well, you do the act first. Hopefully you get caught. You're brought to that house. They're going to call you up to that panel of 13. They're going to read what you did wrong. Oh, you cursed Congress. Oh, you stole this. You beat up your officer, whatever it was. They're going to ask you, what do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? If you plead not guilty, the judge advocate, the person who's like the head of the 13 members is going to present the case for the prosecution, including testimony of sworn witnesses who say that you did that. You beat up that person. You stole from that farmer. And then the defense which is you and you might have someone who can provide legal advice and, and help you out, that is allowed, is going to cross-examine those witnesses. What do you mean by that? Were you actually there? After that, the defense is going to bring witnesses up and say, no, my friend, he was with me in the tent or over, over in Delaware. He was nowhere near here doing that. He was on detail. The court may ask questions as well. They may interject on both sides, just like what the Supreme Court does today. They might interrupt each other. They might ask questions. The defense is then is going to sum up. The court's going to adjourn. So they're going to send you back to the small jail for a little while with the provost troop watching you, hopefully. There'll be a closed session of the court, so no public is allowed in these structures. And they're going to take a poll. Do we believe this person's guilty or not guilty? And majority rules, just like the Supreme Court today. So the majority of 13 will decide your faith. And then hopefully they'll bring you back and they'll tell you what your punishment is if you have one. 
There's going to be two types of punishments here at Valley Forge and throughout the Revolutionary War. Corporal punishment is one that's inflicted on the body. And it's usually to be lashed, as we talked about before. Hopefully, maybe well laid on you if you are really guilty of, of that infraction. A capital sentence is usually by execution or firing squad. And so that's really, you did something really bad, you're going to get to that level. For officers, there is no corporal punishment. So they, they're not going to get whipped, they're not going to get hanged. Instead, there's going to be a private or public, it depends on the court martial panel, reprimand from a superior officer, so a higher level officer or general, or maybe Washington himself, since he is the commander in chief of everybody here at Valley Forge and throughout the 13 colonies in the army. So what's also gonna happen with that is possibly you can be dismissed from service. That means you're no longer an officer. You're out of this army. Goodbye, go away, don't come back. Good example of that is going to be on February 8th of 1777. Lieutenant Guy of Colonel Lamb's artillery will be tried for theft and behavior unbecoming an officer, maybe lying about it, also stealing. That's some, you're a leader, you're, you're a role model, and you're stealing. That's not a good example for the soldiers. So what's going to happen is he's found guilty by the court martial panel. He's sentenced to have his sword broken over his head. So there it is from Mr. Atkinson's study. The one sword broken over the head, that was this gentleman. And what's going to happen to him, that's done on the Grand Parade Ground. So if I go back real quick, the Grand Parade Ground, as you see with my mouse right here, is the large clearing in the park. That's where the soldiers are training and marching, and the soldier huts are along what is Route 23 in North Carolina Line Drive today on those ridge lines. And so he's being shown this is what happens if you misbehave in front of everybody, hopefully, or as many people as possible. And then eventually, once that happens, they kick him out of Valley Forge. Washington wanted the potential of punishments to be part of the soldier's daily experience to create an obedient, effective fighting force in the field. The American Articles of 1776 gave General Washington the power to pardon and mitigate any of those punishments. So if he says, no, that person shouldn't get their sword broken over their head, they should just get a slap on their wrist and continue on. He can he can say otherwise, and he and he has done that. There's at least eleven cases out of the total that I discovered about five percent that Washington intervenes and says the court martial panels are wrong. This is what the punishment is going to be, and I'll talk a little bit more about one of those examples later on. And so again, as you see here, for the encampment of Valley Forge and for the Philadelphia campaign, sixty-six soldiers are going to be lashed, possibly also civilians, 10 death sentences, people paying fines, most likely be the locals. One person had to apologize. That seems the, the very least uh, thing they can do. One person had, a, had to be, uh, two people had to be required to serve on a naval ship. That's very interesting. Reduced in rank, three cases of that as a private. Um, drummed out of the army, we talked about one woman, so there were two other cases of people being sent out of the army, goodbye, see you later. So there were 220 cases of that. And so this is where my research gets a little different than Mr. Atkinson's, because I, I unfortunately can't figure out and haven't discovered yet what sorts of methods he used to come up with these numbers and what resources he had available compared to what I have available, because I had more. I have 246 cases in a shorter period of time. So I can't say for sure, you know, Mr. Atkinson's resources are correct on that, but it's just a baseline. And then, so based on what I discovered, looking at those primary sources, I determined there were at least 246 different types of punishments. And that's gonna be higher than 220 cases because those are individuals and, excuse me, some of those individuals are gonna have multiple things that they do wrong. And so they could be punished for one thing and they can be reprimanded for another thing. So it really just depends. And so you see here, there was 80 people acquitted. That means no evidence. The evidence isn't strong enough to, to prove that you did this wrong thing. 39 people are dis dismissed 
for service. So that means they're not allowed to be in this army anymore. Eight people with debt sentences out of out of the six months here at Valley Forge, and I have an asterisk there, and I'll talk about why I put that there. Forty-four soldiers will receive and 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 farmers, excuse me, will receive lashes here. Seven people will be jailed. Again, most likely the farmers. Same thing with the taking of the property, five cases of that. Name to be published, and we're talking about broadsides, newspapers of the time period to set an example to your local community. When this person comes back, just remember, this person did something wrong. So be mindful of that. And so what I'm gonna talk about now is some of those different types of punishments. So one of them that they do a little bit during the Philadelphia campaign, I haven't found a case of it actually at Valley Forge, is running the gauntlet. But it's a very interesting one. And so, as you see here, this gentleman, he did something wrong. He has to pass through two rows of his fellow soldiers, sometimes as many as 100 on each side. So 200 people he's got to walk through. That must be really embarrassing. But what happens is each of those soldiers that he passes will have a stick or a piece of cowhide, and they are required to strike that individual in the legs, in the back. And so it's pretty gruesome. And what happens is the drummer, as you see right there, is beating a long drum roll to hide the screams of that individual. And another officer is going to have his sword drawn out to be in front of that gentleman to make sure he doesn't run through too quickly. Yeah, at one point uh, during the Seven Years' War, uh, you would see that uh, they would actually use their wooden ramrods as ah. the switch that they beat them with. Mm. But uh, hopefully by the time that uh, <laughs> they're using steel ramrods, uh, that oh. those aren't what they're using at this point in time. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one example. Another one is going to be a wooden horse. You folks might be familiar with like a little wooden rocking horse, you know, with a little saddle on it. No, this isn't, this isn't it. This is very painful. It's got a sharpened point on it. And people are going to be on that for extended period of time sitting on it. And as you see on that image on the right there, they could possibly have chains and, and small cannonballs tied to their ankles, pulling them down for extended period of time as another punishment. So that's a very gruesome one. The image on your left there, that's called a piquette, and that's tying a prisoner to, with one arm to the tree branch for extended period of time, hanging about 12 inches above the ground. And driven beneath that person is a stake, a sharpened point. And the only way to relieve that pressure on your arm, because that arm could break possibly, is to possibly impale your foot. Is another one. But like I said, the most common one is going to be your image on the right there, the lash or the cat of nine tails. And you see it right there on the bottom there. And Russell, that, yeah. my, uh, my understanding with the uh, picket is mm -hmm. that uh, it kind of uh, disappeared by the late uh, 18th century, uh, at yeah. least in Europe. I'm mm -hmm. wondering if, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that tradition might have uh, uh, had a uh, greater continuity in uh, the colonies. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. I know you, you are right about that, Justin, that it does kind of phase out. I know they do use a little bit of that in the British Army in India there. Um, so some of the resources that I looked at mentioned that, but I haven't found any per se using that at Valley Forge, but I think there was one case or two cases, if I remember correctly, in the Continental Army and the British Army where something like that could have been done, which is very gruesome, but you are right. It, it's going to be it's going to be phased out, just like most likely your wooden horse, and then you're you're running your gauntlets. Mostly, it's going to be the the cat of nine tails or some other some other work like fatigue work. You know, doing all the the cleaning and, and filling in the latrines and building fortifications and really working for your crime in that way. So now let me talk a little bit more about kind of what is the most common one, like we were just alluding to there, the, the lash. Cat of nine tails. It's actually going to come in a haversack and it's going to be called the bloody bag because you can see the stains of blood from the previous people that it was used on, unfortunately. So you see there's nine lengths of whipcord. They're each about two feet long, attached to a wooden handle. This is, doesn't have a wooden handle on it right now. And those knots are joined in lengths to inflict the most damage on a soldier. 
25 lashes are going to be the, the absolute minimum. A drummer is going to be asked to carry out the task. And a surgeon is going to be on site to call it off. I know there's going to be cases, especially in the British Army, where the soldier is so bloodied that the surgeon is going to stop it and they haven't gone through the whole amount that is required. So they might wait a couple of days till that person recovers and then set an example for that person to continue their punishment for extended period of time. So it's not all going to happen at once. With that being said, there was anywhere from 50 to 500 lashes, but Congress is going to set the limit to about 100 lashes for that. One, one theory with the, the uh, idea of a, a lash being well laid on, mm -hmm. uh, because the drummer is the one typically applying the lash, uh, as many people know that uh, drummers with, uh, with both the British and the Continental Army, they can be fairly young. Yes. So, uh, you know, maybe well laid on versus just <laughs> absent that term would be having just a, a youth <laughs> doing yeah. the flogging versus an adult drummer doing the flogging. That's, that is right. There was at least, um, if, I, if I remember correctly, a 12-year-old who was a drummer here at Valley Forge, according to the muster roll. And so that would be probably his arm strength, even though he probably grew up working on a farm and all of that and had a hard life getting into the Army. He probably couldn't do a hundred lashes, you know, to someone he may have known, because a lot of cases, these are people you know in your regiment or, you know, possibly in your community that you're doing these punishments too. So that is a really good possibility, absolutely. Now, the most gruesome, besides the lashing, and that's pretty bad, is going to be the gallows, the hangings. There were at least, and I was just double checking my sources this morning, and I was changing some things around and it's six soldiers who were killed were hanged here at Valley Forge and possibly two civilians at least maybe three but I'm leaning towards two Massachusetts Corporal Ebenezer Wild witnessed an execution at the Grand Parade on that large clearing at Valley Forge he writes that the troops formed a circle around that individual and this is an image of John Andre you might be familiar, familiar with him. He's a British spy master. Um, he's famous in turn. And so it's just a good example from the, from, um, of what you would have saw something similar to that here at Valley Forge. And so what's happening is they're going to form that circle around that person. They're going to be brought under, brought under the gallow with a wagon. The person's going to be allowed to speak their last words. The rope will be attached to them. And then the, the, the wagon moves away. However, the noose breaks and the person falls, and they have to go through it a second time. Eventually, they get it right, and the person's gonna be dropped into a hole that they dug right there underneath the gallow. Now, unfortunately, we don't know where they were exactly. There's some rumors that they could have possibly been on the base of Mount Joy, towards the western end of the park, on the other side of, in between possibly Gulf Road, which slices through the park, or the Baptist Trace Road, which is a historic road. So possibly somewhere in that area, this could have been where those hangings took place. So in between tour stop eight and seven. And so here is some of those soldiers from the general orders who will be executed here at Valley Forge. I'm not gonna read all of them for you folks. I'll talk about two of them, for example. June 19th of 1778, Francis Morris. He's a soldier in the 1st Pennsylvania Regiment. So in between tour stop three and four, that's where he'll be located. He's a repeat deserter. So he's escaped numerous times and said, you know what, this isn't for me. I'm gonna get out of here. Got caught, was brought back, possibly given a second chance, possibly by the officer himself, or maybe even up towards George Washington. However, they know about him, he's got a track record, and he's gonna be finally said, you know what, we have to set an example. We gave him a second chance and he didn't do it. So they will hang him on the 19th of, of January of 1778. Another one there I want to talk about, it's the one on June 3rd. It just, we just had passed the anniversary of that. Thomas Shanks, he's in the 10th Pennsylvania Regiment, also in that area of Valley Forge, caught of being a spy. So not deserting, being a spy for the British. Ordered by General Washington, the commander in chief, worthy of death, and therefore will hang tomorrow at guard mounting at some convenient place near the Grand Parade Ground. 
So unfortunately, they don't say where, it's a convenient place. So that could have been anywhere, but possibly based on the topography and other locations of kind of getting good view sheds of the large area of Valley Forge, you possibly believe it could have been anywhere from Tour Stop 7 to Tour Stop 8 on that base of Mount Joy along the Gulf Road or the Baptist Trace Road here in Encampment. Now, there's also another one, Christopher Saki. He's going to be sentenced for stealing horses and be punished as well. Suffered death under the Articles of War that, that they set forth with Congress. Some civilians. Most likely, these civilians are not going to be hanged here at Valley Forge, possibly with that, um, as we were talking about before, in the area with the local governments with the state government or the county government, these people will be tried or gotten that information from the military encampment here at Valley Forge. Joseph Worrell, giving intelligence to the enemy, is gonna be sentenced to suffer death. However, as you see there, May 2nd, it's postponed. So he's supposed to be killed, but something's happening. Maybe he's gonna get a second chance. However, in the footnotes that I was looking at on foundersonly.com, we have our friend here, Alan Aaron Burr, that you might be familiar with, he mentions the following day that he is no more and hangs as a spectacle for the Bucks County Tories. So again, maybe somewhere in Bucks County, this individual was hanged to set an example for the other loyalists in the area to say, if you actively spy for the British or provide them supplies, this is what's going to happen to you. So they want to silence them and say, just stay out of this. Another gentleman there, Wendell Meyer, He's going to be charged for being another sp a spy and supplying the enemy. He's going to be sentenced to suffer death. But there's a footnote there. Well, I was saying a footnote, but I add there that they figured out that he had other people helping him. And unfortunately, he will get hanged, executed somewhere, possibly out towards Lancaster. But his friends escape. So we don't know what happened to those individuals who were helping. They most likely could have been hanged as well. And so this is what Washington's fearing. However, it does happen. We have two maps in our collection of spy maps from those people, some of the soldiers, some of the civilians spying on the Americans, drawing the fortifications, as you see right there, of the encampment, of the avenues, of the soldiers, of the readouts, of the bridge that they built, Sullivan's Bridge, and the roads, like her nut road right here. This is Gulf Road that slices through the park. This is kind of near where 252 is today. The Baptist Trace Road. And so they're bringing that information back and telling the British to attack. Luckily, that never happens for other reasons that I won't get into. But they're pretty successful. While others, possibly like Mr. Shanks and, and some of those other spies I mentioned, aren't, hopefully. Now, Washington's going to release some people. He's going to grant clemency. So you have John Moreland there on the right. He's never deserted. He's going to be sentenced to be hung until he's dead. Now, both of these gentlemen, as you see right there, they're going to be released May 6th. That's the French Alliance. So they celebrate that here at Valley Forge. They do the Fourth of July and they fire the musket firing and the cannon firing and they're, and they're marching and they're drilling here at Valley Forge. And so they're showing off how, how better they have become over time and they will continue to be. And so Washington feels that this is a turning point, not just for the army, but for the war. And he allows these people to continue to serve instead of being hanged. In addition to that, there's going to be people here at Valley Forge or in the area who are going to be tried for punishments. They're going to be tried, hopefully get the punishment, I should say, but they escape. April 16th. John Bates, he's a soldier in the 6th Virginia, another deserter, also asking others to desert. However, he escapes from a local jail in the air, don't know where, unfortunately, and they give a description of what he is. He's 25 years old. He's rather tall. He's going down possibly to Georgia, where he, where he lived before the war. So they're going to put that in a broadside, like those local newspapers, and inform people that if you see this gentleman, inform the Continental Army, inform the local inhabitants and the government, and hopefully this gentleman will be caught and brought to justice. 
So that's just a small sample of what I discovered right now. Um, it's not the end all be all with those numbers. I just wanna clarify that of the soldiers who did misbehave here and possibly the civilians or the soldiers who were hanged or released or who escaped. Um, Justin and the Alliance did a presentation last week about the muster roll project. And so they're always adding to that list of, in determining who was here and my coworker Steve and some others were always trying to pull primary sources from all these different resources out there and collections. And so there might be names that we don't have that if I do this presentation, maybe down the line, I might, we might discover some more people that we can put on there and talk about their story. Now, with that being said, the final part for this presentation is how did discipline and those punishments change the soldiers, hopefully. So many of them wanted to be, they kept it quiet. They didn't write about their experience of being lashed or had to do fatigue duty. They're too embarrassed possibly of the shameful events that led to it. A lot of them believe the loss of honor was the cent, was, was centered to capital, capital punishment. And so the men sentenced to death worried about the shame that their faith would bring to their family and to themselves. Some of them begged not to be sent home in disgrace, but to be rather to be allowed to serve as a private to retrieve his character. Another deserter who faced a death sentence required that his real name be kept secret because of that embarrassment and shame that that person would bring to their family back home. Did that always happen? No, but there are cases as you saw on the list there of some of the soldiers who were able to serve as privates because of their punishments, they got to reduce in rank. So there was some of that. Captain Eshawn Anderson wrote, about witnessing a punishment here at Valley Forge in the Revolutionary War. I groaned, my soldiers groaned, we've all groaned. I would have rather been in battle, such a feeling of sympathy that the tears of joy run down my cheeks. I was not above my poor boys who've each also shared their tears. So he's exper they're experiencing seeing somebody whipped or hanged and it's just a, so it's an emotional experience for them that they're, they're, they're they just feel so sad and they have so much grief another soldier will describe the effects of being flogged uh, the, with the lash of the cat of nine tails they said they felt an astonishing sensation between their shoulder and under their neck and it went from their toenails in one direction and their fingernails in another direction at, and stung them in the heart as if a knife had gone through their body. So they're feeling that all of that going through their body, that terrible punishment that they're experiencing. So overall, discipline is the linchpin for General George Washington's army. If there's no discipline, there would be no Continental Army. No soldiers drilling, marching, foraging for food, and especially fighting the British. These punishments, help George Washington's army grow to become a better fighting force. However, it's not always the case. There's gonna be ebbs and flows depending on the situation in the Revolutionary War. But overall, the army does get better and they become more disciplined to eventually win our independence that we celebrate. I just wanna share before I turn it over to Justin for more questions, some of the resources I used in this presentation as I mentioned, founders only on archives.gov is going to have all those general orders that I pulled from and my coworker Steve pulled from of looking at some of those different names of those peoples and their punishments and when Washington intervened or didn't. Some other great studies is Caroline Cox, Proper Sense of Honor, Service and Sacrifice in General George Washington's Army, Rebellion in Ranks by John Nagel. He's talking about all the mutinies that happened during the American Revolution and, and what those were and, and how they were influenced by the, the facts on the ground. And then again, you have Mr. Atkinson's study there in 1972, for example, and then a couple others. But now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague here. <laughs> sure, so uh, some other book recommendations. Uh, mm -hmm. George Washington's Enforcers, Policing the Continental Army by Harry M. Ward. Uh, so that one specifically looks at uh, the provost of the army that Russell had mentioned earlier. Uh, glad to see Rebellion in the Ranks uh, up on the screen. Uh, there was also a question about uh, uh, any recommended books on uh, the Philadelphia campaign, uh, Valley Forge, or uh, the Monmouth campaign. Uh, uh, 
<laughs> yeah. So my favorite book for Valley Forge is actually by John W. Jackson. It's mm-hmm. a pinnacle of courage. It's one of the harder ones to find. I think it's out of print. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, I, I do think that one is very thoroughly researched. Um, Thomas McGuire published a number of books on the yeah. Philadelphia campaign. No, they're they're right. excellent. So yeah. I would recommend those. Um, regarding Monmouth, uh, Russell, do you have anything uh, you might recommend? Um, there is a book that was written by some of the people who work at the state park there. And I, oh, it's Faithful Sunday. It's called. I don't remember the authors on top of my head. If you Google search Faithful Sunday, that's a really well-researched account of debunking some of the myths of Washington cursing out uh, Charles Lee and and how that really never happened and and the court martial with him and 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 things like that. And it actually does a really good job of talking about the lead up to Monmouth. So what happens after they leave here on the 19th of June of 1778? And they're marching, th- crossing through Bucks County, crossing through Lambertville and, and New Hope, which is t- in modern day today, that area, and then going through New Jersey to catch up to the British. And so it's really well researched and, uh, and really debunking some of those myths that linger with that, with, that, with that battle. So that would be my recommendation for that one. Another interesting one, if you want to see what the, the British are up to, uh, <laughs> Uh, with the British Army in Philadelphia is yes. that title of a book. Uh, very good study. And that's also by Jackson that you mentioned before, with Pinnacles and Courage. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's a really good one, too, that we have in our collection that I enjoy reading. Uh, we have uh, another question. Uh, when it comes to all these disciplinary records, mm-hmm. uh, how might these come into play when a veteran applies for a pension <laughs> later on? Uh, um, so... I'm not 100% sure on that. So definitely desertion is yes. going to be a <laughs> big one that's going to be against you because you are you walked off the job. You did not serve your, your, your quota, your time, which is three years or the duration of the war, whichever comes first. So if you become a repeat deserter and a bounty jumper, which means that you desert from the New York regiment, you, you pretend, you know, you're from the area in New Jersey and then you join the New Jersey Brigade to get that extra money and you get caught, there's going to be some bad things to happen to you. And so there will be people who will be not denied pensions um, for those reasons. And, and the main reasons why people are denied pensions throughout the revolution, um, towards at the end of their lives, is because they don't have the documentation and the witnesses that say they were there as well. Sometimes that lack of documentation works in their favor. Because the, these court martial records, uh, I, often they're recorded uh, in orderly books, uh, and mm-hmm. even then, it's it's not a full accounting. It's not a full minute yeah. of uh, the court martial proceedings. Some mm-hmm. of the larger ones, uh, you know, when officers are involved, uh, you yeah. know, like when uh, Major General Anthony Wayne uh, is brought up on court martial mm-hmm. after the Paoli affair. Uh, that uh, is one example where we have some or, or, minutes. Or Benedict Donald for his misbehaving as the governor of Philadelphia yes. after Valley Forge. Yeah, so no, you're absolutely right. There are, I, I discovered some recently in a colleague of mine's uh, papers who have since retired. He gave us a large collection of, of documents I have to go through. And there was one list, as you were referencing, Justin, of a court martial here at Valley Forge, April 3rd. And it's almost like a narrative of, I said this, you said this. So I have to, I have to fact check this, you know, to see, you know, in all that. But there is, there is, you are right. There is some orderly books out there that do, that do reference things in more detail than, than what I was able to pull from just the general orders, which is just snippets and things like that. <laughs> yeah, but uh, the fact that the those determining the legitimacy of pensions, they wouldn't necessarily have access to those. Right. Exactly. So uh, that is one way in which the lack of documentation uh, works in their favor. But desertion, that shows up on the muster rolls. Yeah. So that's one, that's the one thing that they catch them on. Mm-hmm. And, they, and they try to catch you too, you know? So it's like, you know, America's Most Wanted, for example, they're going to have a bounty on your head, you know, and we got to get this person because this person did something really bad and we want to punish them for it. So they're going to know your name, unfortunately, on that. So, uh, listeners, uh, please, if you have any uh, last questions, uh, please ask them. Uh, as a, sort of a final question of my own, I'm curious, uh, when it comes to 
small scale mutinies, just the, the refusal to do work. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember, uh, I, I think it's in March, a French officer lamented that the fortifications were still not complete in March of 1778 uh, because the men could not be compelled to work. So that, that uh, was, uh, that's essentially a small scale mutiny mm -hmm. uh, and they are dealing with diseases uh, and, and so on. So a lot of this is understood, uh, the, the motivation behind soldiers' refusal. Uh, but uh, the question that I have is, to what degree did uh, officers look the other way? Uh, because if they punished everything, the whole army might just fall apart <laughs> or mutiny as, mm -hmm. as you suggested, uh, you know, in, in a more serious uh, yeah. uh, form of, of mutiny. I really think it comes down to the nature of the individual, who's your officer and in their character and what they're dealing with. Because a lot of the times, you know, there's going to be some social status differences and some of them are going to be more wealthier than others. And so they might be above the suffering, above the lack of food, the, the clothing and tatters and stuff like that. And some others, they might not be. Depends on the situation and, and wherever they are in the war. So I really think it just depends on how they feel, you know, and, and their judgment, because they're going to know their soldiers the best. You know, Washington, you know, he's, he's the end all be all, but he doesn't know everybody personally. He doesn't have time for that, unfortunately. You know, he would love to get out there and talk to the soldiers, but he's getting inundated with paperwork. As we all know, it's, it's the joys of some of our jobs. And, and so that's going to be a problem. You know, it's like, it's pick and choose. Are we going to do the carrot or are we going to do the stick method? And so they're going to do that throughout the war of, you know, upping the bounty, upping the lands. I was just doing a bunch of research and and looking at the different land bounties that states were giving out to their soldiers on top of Congress giving out land bounty for the three years of the duration of the war. So they're trying different things all the time to try to figure out what's the best way to, to, to deal with these soldiers, these disgruntled, you know, they're very disgruntled. <laughs> they are disgruntled employees, <laughs> if you will. Yeah. Uh, just a, a last question. Uh, we'll have to be quick uh, oh, sure, no we're out of time, but uh, uh, have you found any evidence where um, Baron von Steuben uh, had any influence uh, on uh, the, the course of punishments? Uh, of course, he's noted for drill, that form of discipline, but uh, in, in terms of, uh, you know, corporeal punishments or any type of punishments, uh, you know, is there any of that Prussian discipline that is, uh, you know, leaking into the Continental Army as a result of uh, his presence here? I unfortunately haven't really done too much looking into his his take on what's going on, minus the snippets that we always kind of share yeah. with the public. Um, That's my take too. Yeah, I, 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 I haven't looking, really found encountered uh, anything. <laughs> I was looking at one of our our collections of this one of the spy maps that I didn't show, and on the oh, excuse me on the back of it, it was talking about like Steuben and he's inspecting uh, in March fifth reporting that only the two of the readouts are up to date, you know, that needs to complete. So um, I haven't really looked at like, you know, his writings or his references and things like that. You know, we know that he had a temper. We know that um, he loved the curse and the Americans love that too. They loved hearing him curse. And multiple that. languages. And multiple <laughs> languages too, because they weren't, they didn't understand what he was talking about of them marching and drilling in certain ways. So I believe that, you know, if there was anything, you know, that he really did not like, he's going to tell his translators, for example, Alexander Hamilton or John Lawrence, and then they're going to tell the officer of that regiment or that brigade to, you know, to punish that guy. Absolutely. You know? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, uh, Park Guide Russell Brindley, for this uh, very oh. educational talk. Mm -hmm. And uh, for our listeners, uh, Stay tuned for future Lunch and Learn series talks. We're here every Wednesday. Bring your lunch and come along to learn something. So thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Justin. Thank you, the Park Alliance, for doing this. Thank you all for um, listening to me. I, I, hope the, I hope the audio came out a lot better there and I got a little closer to all of you. Um, um, I, and again, um, I know that I don't know a lot and I'm always learning. And so Justin gave me a good recommendation there of research to look, at, um, look for. And so... Um, I'm not going to say I'm the expert in this, but um, I hope we're pointing, we're, we're going in the right direction of, of talking about these topics that 
aren't really addressed and need to be addressed here at Valley Forge. And um, I hope everyone has a wonderful day and, and stay safe. All right. Thank you. No problem. Be well.